Okay, so the next unit we're taking up is that we're going to be thinking about research with and in communities. And so you might be thinking, didn't we just talk about this when we talked about working with people? Aha, people are individuals, communities are collectives. And so that's gonna really affect the approach we take in the sessions for today. So what I'd like you to do is take a moment right now before you begin listening to my lecture and think about a community where you would like to do research. This could be something for the project you're working on with your group, or it could be something that you're just interested in working with a community of some kind. Get a picture in your mind of what that community is, and then hold on to that so we can think about what sort of research we would undertake. So, what is a community? We all kind of feel like we have some kind of instinctive notion of what a community is. If we were asked to name a community, we can say, oh, that's a community, or that's a community. Or to list some communities we belong to, we might be able to come up with some ideas. But often we find that we have some kind of knee-jerk understanding, but we don't actually have any deep analysis of what a community is. And asked to give some kind of limits or boundaries, we run ashore. So the first thing to know is that there are some very traditional versions of community, often which work in concert with ideas of politics in different parts of the world. So for instance, you'll find that there are important what political scientists call cleavages that divide people into different groups. They can be around things like ethnicity, religion. These can often divide people into communities such that we would say, maybe here in Canada, the Francophone community or the Anglophone community, right? And we would expect that Francophones and Anglophones are different from each other in some meaningful way and we're talking about different groups. Of course, that's a very weird definition because of course, there are different kinds of Francophones and different kinds of Anglophones. In addition, there are bilingual people, there are allophones, there are people who have different sorts of relationships to the language that they speak. And so that's one of the reasons that these traditional so-and-so has such an identity, they don't always work for analytical purposes, but it's often important to keep them in mind as you're working, particularly because they function very clearly in people's political lives. Another traditional way that we define communities is by geography. If you think about what your member of the city council talks about when they talk about what's happening in the community, they're talking about what's happening among people who live in their ward, right? And so that's their definition. Or if you think about politicians who do community relations, again, it's about connecting to their voters, right? And often this is geographically conscribed. Because of these sorts of geographic notions, often when people think about going into the community, they envision going to a place. They envision going to a particular location and doing work there, and that's what going to the community means. There's, so that's another kind of very traditional notion of what community is. And of course, there are also ways in which the community is understood as something that's separate from the experts, right? This is in more policy or um, kind of applied fields where people will talk about how, oh, well, we have to go to the community and we have to raise awareness in the community and we need to administer programs for the community and we need to consult the community on what we mean. And often there's really kind of no analysis of what that means. It often is something that's a kind of hybrid of an ethnic or a geographic notion. But the idea is the community is the people who are not the experts, right? So that's all another definition that you hear used quite a lot. Um, and for those of you who are DVM majors, you may hear it in your work or ECH majors. So in any case, these sorts of differences are different ways that people identify communities and talk about communities. Um, but there are other ways to think about community, and I want to present two of them to you. The first is a practice-oriented notion of community. What do I mean by practice? I mean things that people do, not just as a one-off, but regularly. Processes that we engage in collectively with others that through doing them over and over again, we form a bond with those people who engage in similar kinds of practices, right? So. One of the communities I belong to that's a community formed by practice is that I participate in media fandom. 
not too much anymore because I've gotten really busy with work, right? But I have friends who I hang out with and we engage in practices of talking about the same TV shows, making funny jokes about our favorite characters, buying wardrobe items that inspire us to look like our favorite TV characters, yelling about how the writers are terrible, right? We have all these practices that we engage in together. This is a community that's formed by practice, right? Because we come together and we do things together and we recognize each other as other people who are in a community like this. Another kind of community that can be formed by practice is religion, right? Religion, on the one hand, can mean a set of principles that you adhere to or a community into which you were born that has an ethnic quality to it, but it can also be the people you engage in religious practice with on a regular basis, right? So the fellow parishioners at your church, the people who pray at the Jama'a prayer on Fridays in the UCU, right? These are communities that come together through a practice that is commonly held among them, and then they form a relationship with each other. I'm certain you can think of some kind of community you're a part of that is formed through practice, through something you do together. The other thing that's important to think about in terms of communities, and another way of approaching them, is to think intersectionally about communities. This is a concept that was first really identified um, most strongly with the feminist theorist Kimberly Crenshaw, who was thinking particularly about the way that race and gender intersect for um, black women and their experiences of the law. But in fact, it's been used now in a broader set of concepts to think about the way that different identities and different communities people belong to end up affecting how that they are perceived. And so if you want to think about community intersectionally, one of the things you want to do is think about the fact that everybody who belongs to one community can also belong to other communities. Right? And so they exist in the relationship between maybe the communities that come from a geography or that come from something like ethnicity and also communities of practice, communities that are chosen and that they participate in. Right? Um, there's this great line in Kimberly Crenshaw's writing about intersectionality where she points out that all communities are to a certain extent coalitions. Right? So let's say the community of Christians, right, as a community, though it's kind of big and wide open, you could see that there are different sorts of Christians who choose to belong to that community or make sense of themselves as a community, right? So there might be racial divisions, there might be linguistic divisions, there might be um, ideological divisions that really matter to people within it, and yet, at the same time, some of them would want to consider themselves as a community, right? So. It's important to think about what are the coalitions that come together to make up any identity, any community, and then to think about the ways that these different communities will intersect with others or that members will have intersecting identities. So I hinted at something in something I just said, which is the difference between a chosen and an assigned or a descent-based identity. What this is to say is that we have some communities that we belong to because we've chosen to belong to them, right? Those can be of different sorts, but we belong to them because of something we do or something we have picked. There are other communities that people are assigned to, right? They come to have an identity because of who they are, who their parents were, and it is passed on down to them, and or the society around them assigns it, right? So one of the most important assigned communities we belong to are gender communities, right? Our gender doesn't just kind of rise up naked from the earth to encompass us, right? I'm not a woman merely because of my genitalia or my chromosomes, right? But I've been assigned the identity of woman through my life, right? And even people who transition end up being then assigned by others the gender identity markers that come with what they have or being unreadable, which is a totally different issue, which I won't get into right now, right? But the idea is that we have identities that are assigned to us that then put us in communities. Maybe we don't want to be in community with all those people we're in, but sometimes we're compelled to be, right? So it's important to think about communities either as being ones that you can choose or as being ones that people are stuck into and might, and might have a different relationship to. What does all of this mess mean for you as a researcher? 
Well, here's the thing. If you want to research a community, you have to start out with some kind of definition of what the community is. You have to have some kind of sense of who might be in and who might be out of that community, of where you might find people who belong to that community, and kind of how you might interact with them. Right? So that's something you need to start out with. But the problem is that the boundaries and the shape of a community can never be perfectly knowable before you are inside and participating with the people of that community. Right? So in my own thesis research, right, when I was writing my book, I knew I wanted to study the Arab community in New York City. Well, one of the things I knew starting out is that there couldn't be one Arab community in New York City. There were too many possibilities. People were different based on the region they came from. They were of the what country or what even whether they were of an urban or rural background. They were different, different based on whether or not they spoke Arabic. They were different on uh, whether they had been born in the US or born outside the US. They were different based on religion. Arabs are an ethnically diverse and a religiously diverse group. Right? So there were all these things that were going to make people different. And so when I said, I'm going to study the Arab community, I kind of already knew there were more than one community in place. And so then what I worked on and settled on through my research is that I was looking for places where people came together to enact Arab community. I called these communities in praxis, practice. Um, there are different terms you can use to talk about this. But I was looking for places where people came together and said, OK, Having an Arab identity is important to me, and I'm going to do things together with other people who have an Arab identity. And so that was how I defined the community I worked in. If you're going to be working with any kind of community in a research project, it's important for you to have some kind of sense at the beginning of what the boundaries of that community might be, and then to figure out how that community actually works so that you continue to let your definition and your mental picture of the shape of that community grow and shift over time. So one of the hardest things to navigate as a researcher working with communities of any type is the relationship between insider and outsider status. So you, as a person, already belong to a huge list of communities that you can imagine. So take a second and think about all the potential communities someone could identify you with. Okay? Um, some of these you chose, some of these you didn't. Right? Some of these are apparent at first sight, some of them aren't. But all of them are a part of who you are. Remember the kind of problematic I always uh, draw on when we're talking about research in the class is this idea that you are the measuring instrument. Right? Who you are matters for the research. And this is one of those places where it matters the most. Because you, wanting to work with a community, can either approach it as an insider as an outsider, or as something in between. So sometimes, researchers do research on communities they are a part of. They go, they work with people who maybe they already have a personal relationship with, or maybe who they just will see as like themselves, and that the research, the people participating in the research, will identify them as like them. Right? Sometimes people go and do research with communities that they're not a part of. They have no credible claim to any kind of membership in this community. Right? And so for them, it would be totally distinct from, anything, from any kind of relationship that they have with, uh, with their own community identities. Right? You can do both of these types of research, but they have different emotional and intellectual outcomes and concepts that are a part of it. Right? So whichever one you're doing, you just need to be very aware of it. So let's say you want to work uh, in a community you're a part of. So for instance, you um, belong to a certain religious group, right? and you want to see what other people who belong to your religious group think about a particular matter of politics. Right? You're curious, is there any relationship between what people who believe this, who have this religious belief, think about religion or what they think about some political question, right? So you can work with a community and in that community to understand and do it from the basis of I'm like you. So we share this thing. So maybe you'll be a little more willing to open up and talk to me about things. Maybe you'll feel comfortable getting back to me. Often, 
members of marginalized communities don't feel comfortable talking to members of majority communities, right? The reason they might not feel comfortable is that they feel like they might be subject to discrimination, they might be subject to misunderstandings, or they might be at some kind of risk, emotional or even a legal risk, right? Imagine if you're asking people in a country where abortion is illegal to talk about what's their feelings about abortion and have they ever had an abortion or know anybody who did. Obviously, people are gonna be very wary to talk to an outsider about that sort of material. Um, and so sometimes insiders can do a little better at being able to get people to open up about sensitive topics or about forging an initial bond with people such that it becomes plausible for people to want to share the information you want with you. Um, other times, being an insider means people will make assumptions that you will agree with them or that you will feel the same way about something that they do that can actually become incredibly uncomfortable if you don't, right? Or if you're neutral on the topic and just want to know what they think, right? So being an insider can often come with expectations that you're representing the community when you do something, that you um, will behave in line with community standards when you're doing something, um, which may not always be comfortable for you as a person, or may not always be conducive to the research outcomes you're looking to learn about, right? Um, so insiders have certain kinds of access and they also have certain kinds of constraints. The same thing is true for outsiders. Sometimes there's information that outsiders won't be able to give, get, right? They simply will not be allowed into spaces, people will not share their innermost thoughts with them, um, often, if you are an outsider trying to work with a community on some research topic, you need to develop a really close rapport with people before they're willing to share things with you, right? Because you seem like you could be a threat. However, often as an outsider, you're exempt from the community's own guidelines for what it's right and wrong for people to do. I experience this a lot working in communities that are much more conservative than a lot of the decisions I make in my life. I'm an out lesbian, I'm a feminist, I'm a mother with a job, right? Um, I spend lots of time away from my kids doing things professionally. Um, I'm absolutely not a kind of um, traditional woman by any means. I'm also a woman who wants to enter into men's space and talk to men about their lives and their politics, right? And so when I spend time in the Middle East or in conservative communities here in Canada or in the US talking to people about these things, sometimes if I were an Arab woman, I would be subject to why don't you behave more like this or more like that? Why don't you act like other people should do, right? Whereas when I'm traveling in the Middle East, um, there are people who are like, oh, well, you're American or you're Canadian, depending on what they think of me. We don't really need you to follow our rules because we understand that you're a foreigner, right? Um, there's a well-known phenomenon among women who study things in the Middle East that foreign women can get access to spaces that are men's spaces, socially and politically. So people will look at you and say, oh, I don't need to act like you're a woman because you're not one of us. You're outside the community, so you can come in. So, but, so then they're able to kind of cross back and forth between men's spaces and women's spaces more easily because the men don't really think of them as subject to the same gender norms. I had a great example of this happen. Um, I went out to a rural community in Palestine to meet with um, some people who'd run a project there, and I, without thinking about it, held out my hand to shake somebody's hand. And many conservative Muslims don't shake hands across gender boundaries. And I just stuck out my hand because I wasn't thinking, right? And the person kind of looked at me and then reached out and he shook my hand. And then, I, and then he turned to the other women in the group and just kind of nodded to them or did this, which is a very common gesture people do when they won't shake hands. And I felt like an idiot. I'm like, ah, how did I forget and stick my hand out? But of course, he was willing to shake my hand because shaking my hand didn't have the same connotations that shaking the hand of somebody who lives in his community does, right? So often outsiders get a little more flexibility. I've also found that when I'm talking to people who in one way or another bend some of the norms of their communities, 
Sometimes they're comfortable talking about that with insiders because they feel like they understand their context. But if you've built up trust, sometimes it's easier to talk to outsiders about those things because you know they won't judge you, right? Um, that can, of course, backfire terribly if people start telling you what you want to hear or end up having ideas of who you are and what you're looking for. All of this is to say there's no easy way to say, you can do some things as an insider and some things as an outsider, and it's very clear and obvious. The point is you need to think about your insider or outsider status at every point at which you're working with people. But there's some really interesting things to think about here. The first is that there are intersecting identities and community memberships that all of us have that you can use to support research in communities, whether you're similar to them or not similar to them, right? Let's say, so here, I'm building a lot of my research um, in the West Bank at the moment around um, questions of transnationalism, right? I'm not Palestinian, I'm not fluent in Arabic, um, I have a lot of differences with people. I'm part of this international class of people who kind of come in and are experts, right? And that's a very off-putting place to be for a lot of folks in Palestinian civil society. But one of the things I am is a Quaker, that's my religion. And there happens to be a Quaker meeting house and a Quaker school in Ramallah, the de facto capital of the West Bank. And so when I go to Ramallah, one of the places I go is I attend worship at the meeting house, right? And I'm just another Quaker, right? And so from there, I can say I'm working on these issues. And even though I'm an outsider, I've identified something I have in common with people. Right? And I speak a similar language to them on some of these issues. Right? Uh, you can also do this around um, experiences of study or research. When I was working in New York City, um, and I was working with newly immigrated women who were really different from me in life experience, but we all lived in New York City, so we would all sit around and complain about how expensive the rent was. Right? Because that was the sort of thing that we could work together and find something in common. You can also find ways to differentiate yourself from community members that you live with, that you work with, in order to get yourself some space, right? Just to say, okay, I'm gonna take a step back, and maybe if I'm wearing my community member hat, I have this opinion, but if I'm wearing my researcher hat, maybe I'm gonna hold my judgment for right now, right? It's a very tricky thing to work on, but you can find these kind of ways that your memberships intersect with other people's memberships such that you can ease a connection when you're working together. The other thing is to simply accept your limits, right? No researcher can collect every piece of data ever, right? If you are the measurement instrument, you can only record so much. Not everything is accessible to you. So if there's information about men's sociality in the Middle East that I'm never gonna capture, I'm never gonna capture it. That's okay with me, right? I can't learn everything. Um, if there's information about how people speak in particular spaces or information about what particular communities do around certain issues that are not for me, that's okay. I don't need to know that. Communities need to be comfortable with what they're sharing with you and you should never try to force your way to learn more things from a community if it's not something they're willing to share with you. When you're making a decision about a community to work with, Often to, and you need to decide, do I approach this as an insider or do I approach this as an outsider? There's no one answer, like in everything in research. What's important is to understand the accesses you'll be able to get and the information you'll be able to get, and to really think, is there a community I'm already a member of that I can use as the basis for carrying out my research? So for instance, when I want to study refugees in Canada, one of the things I work on is I study private sponsorship groups in part because I'm part of a private sponsorship group, right? Um, and so that gives me a community I'm part of and it makes it part of something that I'm already connected to, right? But it would be wrong of me to study the group I'm a part of exclusively and it would be very wrong of me to take advantage of the folks we're sponsoring for my research purposes because we already have a different kind of relationship. So that's one of the things that you work on to try to get a different approach and try to figure out what the costs and benefits are. Um, this, is never, this is a never ending negotiation about trying to figure out where you stand and where the communities you're working with stand. 
And the only thing you can do is remain aware, remain conscious, and remain ethical throughout the process. So as I keep saying, every research method has some kind of information that it gives you that you can't get from another research method, right? Whatever it is, there's just something that you learn through doing it this particular way that matters. And so one of the things about doing research on and with communities is the type of knowledge you can get. One of the distinctions between types of knowledge you can get in a scenario like this is the distinction between emic and etic knowledge, right? So if we're talking about knowing something emically or something, knowing something that's etic, right? This is the difference between knowing what something looks like from the inside that's etic, that's emic, sorry, versus knowing what something looks like from the outside that's etic, right? So an emic approach is focused on understanding what is happening and what the people who are doing a thing think and what's their attitude and their understanding and their worldview. An etic approach says from the outside, what can we see? What can we track or describe? Right? And it is only through working with communities that you can really gain an emic understanding of what's going on with them. Think about something in American politics that's being written about a lot lately, which is why do poor rural white people vote for Donald Trump? Right? This is a question that is bothering everybody because from certain perspectives, it would seem to be against their interest to do so. Right? So from an etic perspective, you look at this and you say, look, this doesn't make sense. Right? These people are low income. They would benefit from social programs. They would benefit from the expansion of health care. They would bene benefit from more social support, and yet they vote for a candidate who says he's going to destroy these kind of social supports. Why? Why would they do this? Right? So the etic approach is confused right? and says people should do something different, and they must be irrational if they're doing this thing. Well, the emic approach says, OK, people generally act in ways that make sense to them says they act in ways that conform to their understanding of the world. Therefore, there must be something about their understanding of the world that helps to explain this, right? And so what you want to do is learn from people what about their approach to the world makes it make sense for them to vote for somebody whose policies will affect them negatively, right? Why do people vote against their interests, right? The answer is they must have some conception that makes it make sense, so you have to go and learn it. So these are the two approaches. Here's the thing. You can only learn the emic perspective from working closely with a community. You cannot learn it from survey data. You really can't learn it from straight up interviews because there's, you need to build more rapport and you need to get more depth there. You can get close with some interviews. You can't learn it statistically, right? It's, you can maybe learn some of it through working with texts, maybe, right? But you can't get a deep emic perspective on what people think without engaging closely with the people, right? Sometimes you can do that through text if there's a lot of written text on a subject. Sometimes you can do that through interviews if people are very open. But again, that deep engagement with community is what gets you emic knowledge. So if you need to understand how people think and why they make the choices they do to really get a sense of their worldview, then you need to work closely together with communities. Here's the trouble. People's worldviews, what they think, and what their analysis of the world around them is, and that kind of emic perspective may not correspond perfectly to what you think. In fact, it frequently doesn't, right? Um, frequently, you end up working with people and getting a sense of what their worldview is and saying, I actually disagree with that, right? Um, you have a worldview that doesn't work for me, is contrary to what I want for myself or what I would want for you. Your perspective on politics is abhorrent to me, right? I think one of the things that really marks political science research, apart from some of its cousins in the social sciences, is that frequently we work with people, we work on studying people 
whose politics we just detest, right? I have to say, of all the people I know who study conservative movements in Europe and North America, not a single one of them is conservative, right? They do it because they really want to understand what conservatives think or do, and then they have their own normative reasons behind it, right? So perhaps if you're a conservative, you should get into conservative studies because, you know, most of the people who are doing it don't agree with you, so you might have an easier time than them, right? But often, to, or even if you're working with a community who you generally agree with, sometimes the worldview that they prescribe you'll, or the kind of emic knowledge that you'll gather, you just disagree with it, right? Think about how important it is for us to have knowledge about people who are climate change denialists. What do people who are climate change denialists actually think or believe? We need to know this because if you're somebody who believes climate change is real and believes it's an urgent threat to human society, you actually need to know how to change their minds, right? So knowing what they think is useful to this, right? So this is part of, so you have to go through this process of learning things and really understanding it in a way that may be distasteful to you, right? It's okay to disagree with a community you're studying. It's okay to say this community has goals and ideas and norms that are not in line with mine. You cannot impose your worldview on a community you're studying. If you're asking people, so what do you think about climate change? And everybody in the community you're working with says, oh, it's not real, right? Or let's say you want to study the Flat Earth Society, right? And you are fairly convinced the world is round, right? but you want to understand their perspective on something, you don't go in screaming, the world is round, the world is round. Now explain to me why you think something wrong, right? You're going to get nowhere with that, and no one's actually going to share with you, right? And think about all your obligations of reciprocality and of care and accountability to your research subjects. Those hold even if they're saying and doing terrible things, right? So you have to work out how you can negotiate ethically and emotionally learning about things that will be challenging for you or will make you struggle. And also how to work with people who have very different worldviews than you. So this is one of the challenges of working in communities. Sometimes, in some contexts, it's appropriate to do a little pushing, right? To engage in a little bit of dialogue with people and say, really? I don't think that's true, right? Sometimes it's not appropriate to do so. You have to use your judgment. You have to develop a sense of judgment around this. But really, the important thing is, if you believe it's necessary that the community as, of scholars as a whole or people like you have a good understanding of what people's worldview is, you have to take the time to really get to know it as they know it. That's hard work, but it's one of the most necessary things researchers can do.